Nigeria is home to a wide array of Christian denominations, reflecting the diverse religious landscape of the country. Nigeria has hundreds of Christian denominations ranging from mainstream ones like the Roman Catholics, Anglicans and various Protestant denominations to various independent and Pentecostal churches. So, how did Nigerians come to know and embrace the message of Christianity considering that at the beginning of the 19th century, Christianity was only in the fringes of the Niger area. In this three-part documentary, we embark on a voyage through time to unravel the intricate tapestry of faith, devotion and cultural exchange that shaped the trajectory of Christianity in this land. From ancient encounters with Catholic missionaries to the blossoming of Pentecostal movements, Let's delve into the stories of pioneers, believers, and visionaries who carved a unique path for Christianity within the Nigerian landscape. This is the story of how a spiritual message found fertile ground, forever altering the course of Nigeria's history and leaving an indelible mark on its people. The first recorded contact of Christianity with the area called Nigeria today was in 1515 when Catholic missionaries set up school in the Oba of Benin's palace for the Oba's sons and those of the chiefs. This was mostly through the influence of Portuguese traders who had strong trading relationship with the Benin kingdom during that era. In spite of this early mission endeavor, the seeds of Christianity struggled to take root. The Benin people at the time were not driven by a favor for this foreign faith. Rather, the elite wielded it as a tool to solidify trade ties. The second wave of Christian missionary activity began in the mid-19th century with the Wesleyan Methodist Mission and the Church Missionary Society CMS. Three main events must be identified as key enablers of the spread of Christianity in Nigeria in this period. In no particular order, number one was the abolition of slave trade and the resettling of recaptive Africans in Freetown. This group of people became the early converts and ultimately provided early native workforce to the European missionaries that would later arrive. Some of them were missionaries in their own right. Secondly was the exploration of the river Niger by the Landa brothers, which opened up the interiors of Nigeria to European traders, missionaries and subsequently colonialists. This geographical unveiling acted as a catalyst in bridging distant cultures and allowing Christianity to penetrate deep into Nigeria. And number three was the Clapper movement, which was born from the evangelical fervor of the 18th century within the Church of England and started to coalesce around the residents of Clapham in London. Many abolitionists, that's those who campaigned against the slave trade in England like William Wilberforce, were members of this movement. This collective of reformists campaigned vigorously for the abolition of slave trade and the Christian evangelization of Nigeria. The interplay of these three factors had significant impact on the trajectory of Christianity in Nigeria as we will see. On February 23, 1807, after three decades of relentless campaign by British abolitionists, the British Parliament passed the Slave Trade Act of 1807, which outlawed the international slave trade but it didn't end slavery itself. So, they tried something else. In 1811, the Slave Trade Felony Act, which made the slave trade felony in the British Empire, was passed. With these, the Royal Navy established the West African Squadron to suppress the Atlantic slave trade by patrolling the coast of West Africa, where slave-carrying ships were seized and liberated slaves were resettled in Freetown, modern-day Sierra Leone. Some of these freed men and women converted to Christianity and also received Western type education and they ultimately became the bearers of the Christian faith to their kinsmen after they returned back to their homeland in Nigeria. This group of returnees are popularly known as the Soros. One of these freed people was someone named Samuel Ajaye Crowder, a man whose name stands tall in the history of Christianity in this land. Fast forward to the year 1840, 33 years after the initial abolition of the slave trade. You might think that things would have changed by now, but unfortunately, they have not. 
despite the best efforts of the West African squadron that we mentioned earlier, more and more people were still being captured and sold into slavery. It's as if the evil trade just would not stop. Thomas Boxing, who had taken over from William Wilberforce as leader of the Clapham sect, noted that twice as many people were now victims of this evil trade compared to 1807 when the Abolition Act was passed in Parliament. To remedy this, he proposed agricultural trade as a replacement to the pernicious trade in slaves and the introduction of Christianity to bring about the moral and spiritual regeneration of Africa ends the slogan, the Bible and the plough. On the back of this, the Church Missionary Society, CMS, an independent voluntary society within the Church of England in 1841 appointed Frederick Sean, a missionary of eight years experience and a linguist, alongside Ajari Crowder, whom we mentioned earlier, to join others in an expedition to the Niger area. This first expedition had mixed results, as about one third of the over 160 people on that expedition died from malaria and other causes. While this was a very discouraging outcome, it wasn't the end. Between 1840 and 1842, over 500 Saru returnees had resettled in Badagri and Abelkuta from Sierra Leone. One of them, named James Ferguson, wrote to the Methodist mission in Freetown requesting for missionaries. On the back of his request and those of others, the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society sent Thomas Batch Freeman, a man born in England of an English mother and African father. Batch Freeman arrived in Badagri on Saturday, September 24, 1842, and was received by James Ferguson and some of the chiefs of Badagri. A bamboo cottage was quickly built and the following day after his arrival, which was a Sunday, the first Christian service was held in Nigeria. This marked the beginning of the second wave Christian evangelization of Nigeria. From Badagri, Bat Freeman proceeded to Abeokuta on invitation of Shodeke, the Egba leader, where he spent two weeks proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Following the ill fated 1841 Niger expedition, Crowder was ordained an Anglican minister in 1843 and on January 3, 1844, while in Freetown, he led the first church service ever to be conducted in Yoruba language, or indeed any Nigerian native language. On August 3, 1846, Ajay Crowder, Henry Townsend, and Charles Goma arrived in Abeokuta to start the CMS Yoruba mission. They were welcomed by the Niegba leader, Shubua, who succeeded Shudeke alongside his chiefs. They donated money and material to help kickstart the mission work in Abeokuta. This one reception was also down to the fact that many of the Saru returnees were reunited with their relatives whom they had been separated from by their captors. By providence, Crowder also found his mother and sisters in Abeokuta having been separated from them for 25 years when he was captured as a little boy. She became his first convert in Abeokuta and was baptized by him. Although Badagri hosted the first mission station in Nigeria, the work prospered more in Abeokuta. The converts in Abeokuta demonstrated unwavering commitment to their newfound faith. Some endured persecutions from worshippers of the traditional religion. They were whipped, ostracized, and put in chains. Yet, many held on to their newfound faith. Another event that will impact the spread of Christianity in Nigeria was the annexation of Lagos and removal of Kosoko, its slave trading king, in 1851. Kosoko was an ally of King Gezu of Dahomey, and both men were active participants in the slave trade. Following several unsuccessful attempts to get Kosoko to end the slave trade in Lagos, Henry Vane, one of the Clapham sect leaders, executed a powerful public relations coup by deploying Samuel Ajay Crowder to argue the case for British intervention in Lagos before Queen Victoria, Lord Palmerston, and the Lords of the Admiralty. Bishop Crowder argued that if Lagos were placed under Akitoi, whom Kosoko had displaced, and allied with Britain, British commercial interests will be guaranteed and the slave trade will be suppressed. Hence, the Royal Navy initiated the bombardment of Lagos in November 1851. 
and successfully took the city in the following month. Following the capture of Lagos, Kosoka was deposed and with Akitoe reinstalled as Oba, a new treaty between Lagos and Great Britain was signed on January 1, 1852. The treaty abolished the slave trade and human sacrifice, commencing the consular period in Lagos history. A decade later, however, Lagos was fully annexed by the British and became a colony. In any case, with Kosoko out of the way, both the CMS and Methodist mission sent missionaries to Lagos and set up mission outposts in the town. Within a few decades, Lagos will go on to become one of the most strategic missionary centers in Nigeria. Another point that has to be made was that at the time when the Christianization of Nigeria began, Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation in Europe had occurred several centuries before. So various denominations with sometimes different doctrinal beliefs had evolved, and some of these differences were brought to Nigeria by the European missionaries since many of them came from different denominations themselves. As already mentioned, the Methodists and the Church of England through the CMS were the first to arrive during this period, but many others would later on follow. In 1850, Thomas Jefferson Bowen, a missionary from the Foreign Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, arrived in Badagri with intentions to pioneer the Baptist mission in the interiors of Yoruba land. Due to the political unrest of the time in Yoruba land with the Kiriji war still raging between the Akiti Confederacy and the Ibadan army, he stayed with Henry Townsend of the CMS in Abeokuta for one year. Studying the Yoruba language and observing the strategies of the missions in Abeokuta, that's the Methodists and the Anglicans. Following an ill-fated attempt to reach Igbohu, he settled in Ijaye in 1852 upon the insistence of Kurumi, the ruler of Ijaye. There, the first successful Baptist mission in Nigeria was established. In 1855, he moved to Obumosho where another pioneering work began. A year later, Bowen and his wife left Nigeria finally and other missionaries took over from him. By the end of 1860, the Baptist mission in Yoruba land had suffered terribly. Most of the missionaries had either died or returned home except for one or two in Lagos. However, within a few decades, Ogbomosho will become the Baptist mission's most successful station up till that point in time. On the CMS front, Following Crowder's ordination as bishop in 1864, Christianity had started taking root in Nigeria and was beginning to displace the ancient gods and deities. New mission stations were opened in Ida in 1864, Lokoja in 1865, Boni in 1866, Brass in 1868, Osama in 1872, Okobo in 1875, and Asaba in the same year. More stations were established in the years that followed. An Irish missionary named Opuadel and his team arrived in Wari in 1846. From there, he moved to Calabar where he pioneered the Scottish Presbytery Mission or Church of Scotland Mission. Wardell insisted on a complete conversion meaning that the convert must demonstrate a thorough grasp and acceptance of Christian principles. He did not believe that a person could be made into a convert by gradual process as practiced by some of the other missions. Due to this very strict requirement, therefore, the first baptism of the mission did not happen until about seven years, and even at that, he felt it was horrid. The first Roman Catholic presence in Nigeria during this era was through slaves who, having regained their freedom in Brazil, returned to settle in Lagos. These were the Amaros. This group, having sent a request for a missionary back to Brazil, received a certain Antonio, who came to Lagos as a missionary in Nigeria. Antonio was born in Sao Tome around 1800 sold into slavery as a 10-year-old where he was bought by Roman Catholic priests, set free and then educated. In 1876, Theodore Hawley arrived in Lagos and he played a pivotal role in expanding the Catholic mission 
into the interlands of Yoruba land by establishing mission stations in Abeokuta, Oyo, and Ibado. Like many of the missionary organizations of that era, the Catholics also did not only establish churches, they also established schools and emphasized not just on literary studies, but also manual work. The reports of the successes recorded by the Catholic missionaries in Yoruba land encouraged others to come in as well. Other missions were started in Lokoja in 1884, which signaled the beginning of the Upper Niger mission. By 1909, there were 17 mission stations and about 2,000 Catholic Christians across areas like Wari, Sapele, Asaba, amongst others. There were also many instances where natives wrote to missionaries to come to them as we've seen with returnee Saros from Sierra Leone and Amaros from Brazil. A similar occurrence brought the Kwa Iboi mission in today's Cross River and Akwa Ibom states. In 1886, the chief of the Ibeno tribe located at the mouth of the Kwa Ibo River wrote a letter to missionaries of the Scottish Presbyterian Mission in Calabar to open a mission in their area. Due to absence of manpower from the Calabar mission, however, the missionaries in Calabar sent an appeal to Grattan Guinness, the founder of Harley College, a non-denominational missionary training institute, with ties to the great revivals of Dior Modi and Ira D. Sankey that swept the British Isles in the late 1800s. On the back of this call, a certain Irish man named Samuel Bill arrived in Calabar in October 1884, from where he travelled to Ibeno town and was received by the chiefs. Here, he pioneered the Kwa Ibo mission which birthed the Kwa Ibo church, one of the popular denominations in Nigeria today. Samuel Bill was also a contemporary of the famous Mary Slessor, a missionary with the Scottish Presbyterian mission, who served tirelessly amongst the ethnic people. One of the most significant events that opened the Igbo interlands to Christianity was the destruction of the Long Juju or Arochuku Shrine in 1902. Following the successful expedition against the Aros by British colonialists, the Presbyterian mission was able to spread into Igbo land from Cross River, the Kwai Igbo mission from Obuno, while the CMS was also able to spread its tentacles into the Bende and Arochuku areas. The Catholics arguably had the most success in this part of Nigeria, and one of the most influential Catholic missionaries was a man named Joseph Shanahan, an Irish priest who took over the Onisha mission in 1905 and changed some of the strategies that had been adopted by his immediate predecessor, such as reducing expenditure on charity programs, adopting building of schools as a missionary strategy, and focusing on more direct evangelization. This brought much success, such that between 1895 and 1905, when Shanahan took over, there were less than 4,000 baptized Catholics, but over 100,000 in 1932 when he retired. Some of his fellow missionaries were however not too pleased with his methods. There were those who opined that the desire for education amongst the people did not automatically translate to commitment to the faith. But Shanahan argued that once the children became devout, they would bring their parents into the church. He was also very competitive, especially in ensuring that he edged out other missions from other denominations by cultivating the support of the Warren chiefs, which is quite ironical, given that the land upon which the Catholic mission began in Onisha was donated by Ajayi Crowder, an Anglican priest. This rivalry between Catholics and Anglicans especially still plays out in some parts of Igbo land till date. Another strategy which he adopted was a policy of non-interference with the cultures and traditions of the Igbo people except in rare cases. He instructed missionaries on dying to appreciate the significance of those customs and see in them ways in which they could serve as pointers to the Christian God. These differed markedly with the attitudes of some of the other missions, 
who more or less require the people to totally denounce their customs in order to become Christians. In ancient times, the people of northern Nigeria were mostly enemies until Usman Danfodius Jihad in 1804. Now it must be said that Islam had been in the north and in fact Nigeria long before Danfodius, but the Jihad reformed it and effectively made Islam the state religion of the Sokoto Caliphate. While Islam flourished in what we today refer to as the core north, most of the tribes who weren't conquered by the caliphate or areas we today refer to as the middle belt did not embrace Islam with the same fervor. The earliest effort to evangelize the north during the 19th century were those of Ajay Crowder and the Ninja CMS mission, which resulted in the establishment of a mission station at Ibebe in 1862 where the first baptism in northern Nigeria took place. Another station was established in Ega in 1873. There were also invites to Crowther from the emirs of Kotangora and Nasarawa in the early 1880s. But these attempts did not yield much result as these emirs only wanted the mission stations around so they could provide schools but would have nothing to do with Christianity. On December 4, 1893, three young men, Walter Gowans, Roland Bingham, and Thomas Kent, landed in Lagos, compelled by the love to share the good news of Jesus Christ with many of the people in Nigeria and Sub Saharan Africa. They founded the Sudan Interior Mission, but being rejected by established mission agencies of the time, they set out alone. In 1894, Gowans and Kent died from malaria and Bingham was forced to go back to Canada to recover. His attempt to return to Nigeria also ended in malaria, but with his vision and faith undeterred, he sent other Christians. They landed in 1902 and travelled inland, establishing a base in Patigi, 450 kilometers from Lagos. Bingham continued to support the Sudan Interior Mission Team through prayers, finances, and by sharing their stories with other Christians. The same work recorded considerable success after its initial setback, and as a result of that missionary endeavor, the church denomination that came of it is today known as Equa, that's the Evangelical Church Winning All, formerly known as the Evangelical Church of West Africa. Pentecostalism in Nigeria can be traced to the activities of the Aladura group that preceded the Babalala revival of 1930. These will be explored in more detail in the second part of this series. In 1937, an Englishman named Sidney Granville Elton arrived in Nigeria from England in response to a divine call to be a missionary in Elisha. He was 30 years old and had been an elder at the Apostolic Church at Shrewsbury a town in the historic county of Shropshire. Elton's mission was clear to him. He was to raise leaders, preserve the gains of the revival that broke out in 1930 and set a foundation of sound doctrines for the rising Nigerian church. At the time of his arrival, the Pentecostal revival of the 1930s was already underway and Elton would go on to play a major role in the nurturing of Pentecostalism in Nigeria. In the 60s, he provided a platform for international evangelists like Gordon Lindsay, T.L. Osborne and others seeking to carry out evangelistic work in Nigeria. In the 70s, he became the father of the Pentecostal charismatic movement that emerged in Nigerian university campuses. In the 80s up to his passage on 13th January 1987, he concentrated on teaching prophetic truths about the Kingdom of God and raising leaders who are today leading lights of the church in Nigeria. Pi Elton's only child, Ruth Elton, following the footsteps of her parents, remains in Nigeria, living in Elisha Ocean State. Apart from the various denominations whose missionaries labored and toiled in spreading the Christian message all over Nigeria, there were also non-denominational organizations that played very crucial roles like the Scripture Union SU, the Fellowship of Christian Students FCS, and Nigerian International Fellowship of Evangelical Students NIFES, amongst others. 
These organizations operated mostly in schools and were pivotal in the raising of a new generation of Christians and Christian leaders who had a broader view of the kingdom assignment beyond the encumbrances of denominational dogma. Many of today's church leaders were at one point or the other influenced by these evangelical organizations. Beyond religious conversions, Missionary efforts yielded profound societal transformation. Western education became a cornerstone, exemplifying the missionary's vision for an enlightened population to model Christian values. Schools like CMS Grammar School in Bariga, Lagos, which was the first secondary school in Nigeria, and many others have played a significant role in nurturing many national leaders and in national development. It must also be mentioned that not all of the missions or missionaries shared similar views on education for Africans. There were those who felt that Africans should be educated enough to be able to serve as teachers, catechists, and even ministers, but not beyond that. Some were skeptical that any kind of higher education in a formal institution was unnecessary and potentially dangerous as he had the tendency to produce a class of natives who considered themselves better than their countrymen. Henry Townsend, while arguing against the founding of an institution to train the African staff of a CMS in 1851 said, We are, in fact, I am happy to think, performing the work of training native school masters without an institution. It is our aim to check that pride of dress and caste that unhappily sometimes obtains with the African, so that if the driving of a nail could save a door from falling off its hinges, his own hands could not drive it. Also, given the Zyges of that era, some white missionaries perceived Africans as inferior Hence, educating them will make them start seeing themselves as equals to the white people. And Riven, the secretary of the CMS during this period, however, did not agree with this view and actively supported the education of Africans and the ordination of Samuel Ajari Crowder as the first black bishop in Nigeria. His vision was for the Nigerian church to become self-governing, hence that more Nigerians needed to be groomed and eased into the leadership of the church while the missionaries provided oversight functions until when they can pull out completely. Henry Johnson, whose father was sponsored to Kew Gardens, London, wrote about Henry Venn thus, That great and good man, whose name asks for us a familiar household ring, which has never failed to kindle in our hearts a feeling of genuine enthusiasm. Mr. Venn was the man who laid his time his talents and whatever I had of this world's goods upon the altar of sacrifice, labored with uncommon energy and zeal, and died thinking and praying for Africa. Interestingly though, Henry Venn never set foot in Africa till he died. Regardless of these conflicting views, other missions also started their own schools such as Lagos Boys High School in 1878, Baptist Academy in 1886, St. Gregory's College by the Roman Catholics in 1881. Many others will soon do the same in the years that followed. These laid the foundation of the primary and secondary school system in Nigeria. Today, Christian denominations continue to blaze the trail in the education of Nigerians, with many of them having their own higher institutions as well. Another import of this early missionary effort was the translation of the Bible into several native Nigerian languages, starting from Efik to Yoruba, Hausa, Nupi, Igbo, Kanuri, etc., by the various mission agencies operating in the country. These also aided the development of writing systems for these languages in instances where none existed prior. The missionaries came with schools and hospitals and they helped create primers for our languages. Lastly, the introduction of Christianity challenged some of the superstitious beliefs and traditions that had been held and practiced for centuries unquestioned. Some of these practices in some local communities, like the killing of twins, were outrightly barbaric and good riddance to them. However, 
The unintended consequence was a demonizing of all African culture, even the good ones. This created a sort of identity crisis in the minds of African Christian converts, and in fact Nigerians in general, as becoming Christian became synonymous with becoming European in one's dressing and mannerisms and worldview. This became a source of conflict and sometimes schism within the early Christian movements in Nigeria. We will explore this further in the next part of this series. The first part of this documentary series concludes with Nigeria's transformation from a land untouched by Christianity to a vibrant center of faith. From the diverse regions of the country, pioneers, missionaries and indigenous leaders have shaped a narrative that is still evolving. In part 2 of this documentary, we will delve deeper into the Nigerianization of the church and the inspiring local leaders who played significant roles in Christianity's journey across the nation. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you are notified when the next chapter drops. Thank you for watching and God bless.